Christians can't be demonized. Number one, that's shifting the burden of proof. Number two, that's not a very strong case to build anything on. What does the Bible not say? And number three, and this is the main point here, the idea that Christians can be demonized contradicts everything we understand about the new creation. It contradicts everything we understand about the nature of salvation. It contradicts everything we understand about the power of the Holy Spirit and the wholeness that comes to someone who is redeemed. So let's look at the believer's identity and nature. Now we're going to get into the meat of this now that we've established some groundwork. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 14. The Spirit is the guarantee, the first installment, the pledge, a foretaste of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own purchased possession, his believers, to the praise of his glory. One more time, gentlemen, bring up this slide. What does it mean to be demonized or possessed? They're one and the same. Okay, so with that in mind, bring it back to me now. Demonization is possession by way of habitation. That's what the original language says. That's the word the Holy Spirit used. That's the Bible. Compare that with what we just read in Ephesians 1.14, that we are God's own possession. So it begs the question, can a demon possess you while God possesses you? Well, of course not. And that's not just an argument from emotion. That's to understand the nature of what it means to be redeemed. God takes you from the powers of darkness. Let's read another scripture. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 23. So write these down. Ephesians 1, 14. 1 Peter 2, 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 23. And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Now, I'll tell you what I would have said at this point, but that's not what demonization means. It doesn't mean possession, or demons can't own anything. Well, look at the language. Look at the Greek. What does the Bible actually say? If I'm saying the word doesn't mean possession, and the Bible says it means possession, what are we going to believe? You have to believe the Bible. And again, the big hurdle for me was that I had heard differently for so long and so adamantly and repeated in so many different spheres of influence that I had trouble embracing what the scripture gave me. That's a problem. And that shows kind of how we've wrapped our identities around some of the things that we believe. First John 4, 4. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people. Watch this now. This is very, very clear. Because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Well, what spirit is in the world? That's demonic power. That's the kingdom of darkness. And very clearly in 1 John 4, 4, the Bible makes the distinction and very plainly lays out for us the fact that one spirit is in you and the other is not. One spirit is in you Another spirit is in the world. Well, what spirit is in you? The Holy Spirit. What spirit is in the world? Those are demonic powers. So 1 John 4, 4 makes the delineation quite clear. And it says one is in you and the other is not. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And by the way, at this point, I would be asking, well, how do you explain sin? How do you explain sickness? We're going to address that. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, watch this here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul the Apostle, when he talks about the old things that have passed away, he's talking about the spiritual world to which we once belonged. The old nature in the spirit realm, everything having to do with your old life. And now he says it all becomes new. Well, where in the Bible does it say that we get delivered once we're saved? Big question. Bible has the answer. The Bible makes it clear 
in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath, this is past tense, who hath delivered us from the powers of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You guys, powers of darkness literally means domain of darkness. It's specifically talking about the devil and his demons. Let me read this again and understand that powers of darkness is talking about the devil and his demons or Satan's kingdom. So let's read it like that again. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light. That's your identity. You are a being of light, a reflection of the glory of God. This is why I say this idea that Christians can be demonized is rooted in legalism because you still think you're working for your new identity when God's already given it to you. I'm not saying there are no consequences for when we sin or compromise. There are. We become more susceptible to deception and attacks and so forth. But here the scripture makes it clear that our identity in Christ is ultimately at the base of who we are. That's the root of who we are. That the innermost being. We are inheritance of the saints of light. Who hath delivered us from Satan's kingdom? Who hath delivered us from the domain of darkness? Who hath delivered us from the devil and his demons? The Bible clearly says that when you're born again, you're delivered from demons right there. And it's as plain as day, especially if you understand what this, um, this, this kingdom of darkness is or the power of darkness is. Now, this begs the question, why not just get people saved then? Where then is the place for deliverance ministry, specifically deliverance from possession, which is exorcism? Where then is the place for exorcism? Well, again, deliverance is more than just exorcism. So let's answer this question in a broad sense first. When you understand that the believer is delivered from demons and the devil and the powers of darkness when they are born again, naturally you begin to ask, well, what's the point of deliverance ministry? Well, first of all, if you ask that question, hear me now, I'm saying this because I love you. If you ask that question, then that shows that you don't understand the full scope of deliverance because you're so focused on just exorcism. You think that's all deliverance ministry is. You've forgotten that Christians need deliverance too, not from possession, but from accusation, temptation, deception, and torment. So Christians still need deliverance. So where's the place of deliverance ministry? Well, there's a lot of things that people still need to be delivered from other than possession and demonic habitation. Number two, deliverance by exorcism can lead to salvation. Think about the demoniac. He had a legion of demons in him. He comes because he sees freedom before him. Desperate to be free, he approaches the Lord, falls at his feet. And the Lord casts those devils out of him with a word. Okay, so the demons come out, and now what does this man do? He begs to follow Jesus. Think of Mary Magdalene. She was delivered from demons before she followed Jesus. Now, I understand that in the resurrection narrative, the Bible refers to her as the one who had demons, but that's referring to her past, not, at, not referring to her present during the crucifixion or the, during the resurrection narrative, I should say. So some will say, well, Mary had demons after she followed Jesus. No, she had demons before she followed Jesus. And when her demons are being referenced in the resurrection narrative, it's actually revealing what had happened to her previously. And it actually just referred to her past so that it could distinguish her from the other Mary. So Mary was delivered from possession, demonic possession, before she came to Christ, and now she wants to follow him. And the many that Jesus delivered in his ministry while here on earth, how many of those do you think were born again? How many people do you think were born again before Jesus died on the cross? Yet he's driving demons out of them, and they followed him afterwards. So exorcism can lead to salvation. I'll touch on this a little bit more a little bit later, but exorcism can lead to salvation. So we mustn't be completely dismissive with it. So it's not as though just because Christians are delivered when they're saved, that there's no place ever for exorcism because some people, if they're writhing on the floor and screaming, how are they going to hear the gospel? They don't even want to be near a church. They don't want to be near preachers. They don't want to be around others. So get that demon out and then minister the gospel. I found this to be very, a very effective way to minister to people. And then they live their Christian life afterwards and they're free. 
So that question, why not just get people saved? What's the point of deliverance? That forgets these two points. Number one, that del- John chapter 6, verse 66 says, At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Now, whether you believe that Judas lost his salvation or that he was never saved in the first place, what we can conclude is that he wasn't a born-again believer at the time that Satan entered him. So Judas was not a born-again believer at the time of his possession. And let me stress this again. Whether you believe he lost his salvation or whether you believe that he was never born again to begin with, at the time of his possession, he was not a born-again believer. And so the Bible tells us in 1 John 2, 19, these people left our churches, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed. When they left, it proved that they did not belong to us. In fact, Jesus referred to Judas as the son of perdition. This has to do with damnation of the soul here. John 12, 6. Not that he cared for the poor. Speaking of Judas, he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. So even while he's working with ministry, he didn't care about the people. He, he, he wasn't doing it because he loved the people or the Lord. He was doing it for the money. And then Jesus very clearly spells it out that Judas was not a true follower. Jesus said, I chose the 12 of you, but one is a devil. Finally, Jesus declared himself. Guys, these are the words of Jesus here. He declared that Judas wasn't clean. He, he separates Judas from his other disciples. Well, you can say, well, that's because he betrayed Jesus. Well, so did Peter. Peter betrayed Jesus, but Jesus didn't call him unclean in the same way that he called Judas unclean. John, th- John 13, 10 and 11 say this. Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. Now, let me just kind of break down this analogy that Jesus is giving us here. He's talking about the fact that all of us need some work done on this. All of us pick up dirt as we move along in life, right? And so those who are born again, we've been cleansed for the most part. But as we exist in this world, as we move, sometimes the feet need some washing. So Jesus is saying, look, everyone makes mistakes. Everyone needs some work. And you disciples are clean. And he says, but not all of you. In other words, some of you are unclean in the sense that you just need a little bit of washing. And others are just completely unclean. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. So keep in mind that the other disciples were unclean. Peter betrayed him too, yet Jesus didn't describe him in this same way. So the fact that Judas didn't care for the poor, the fact that you can move in power, the fact that you can call Jesus Lord and still not be saved, the fact that Judas constantly stole from the ministry while never really caring for the Lord or the people, the fact that Judas was called the son of perdition, The fact that Jesus called him unclean, Jesus called him a devil, the fact that Jesus separated him from the other disciples, it's conclusive that Judas was not a genuine born-again believer at the time of his possession, whether you believe he backslid or whether you believe he was never saved to begin with. In just a moment, I'm going to talk about this other portion of scripture, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm going to talk about get thee behind me, Satan, Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, didn't Jesus tell us to pray for deliverance? Philip in Acts 8, uh, the demon possessed people in the synagogue. We're going to go, we're, there's several more we're going to do. As I told you at the beginning, this is going to be extensive. So let me take just a quick break while Steve just tells me how the comment section is doing. Well, Spirit Family, you have been alive and active throughout this whole stream. I've been reading some of your comments some of your questions and your thoughts. You guys have been incredible. I want to read just a few here. Faye writes, Blessing, Pastor David. Thank you so much for for you touching on this subject. As I see so many Generation Z kids I know asking about demon possession. I also see another comment here from our friend Jason. Love the content and the topic, Pastor. My teens needed this today. So Gen Z, we're coming for you. This is a great message. We're going to get back into it in just a few moments, guys. Thank you, Steve, and I appreciate that. And if you're watching and you're being blessed by this, maybe your mind is being changed. And that's the goal here is to help correct some of these. And again, doing it in love. I I wanted to come to you in humility and love. Again, we're on the same team. We all believe in deliverance. We all believe in exorcism. We all believe Christians need deliverance. We all believe the world needs to be set free. We all believe we're in spiritual warfare. But this idea that Christians can be demonized, you can do without that. I promise you. I do without that. And I still practice exorcism. I still see God set the captives free. I still see Christians set free. 
But this idea, as I outlined just a little bit earlier, has a lot of problems with it that can result in a lot of condemnation. It's based in legalism. It's anti-scripture. We got to correct this. Why? Because we love the deliverance ministry and we want to see it go further than ever before. And if that's going to happen, we have to make sure we're built on a solid foundation. So let me know in the comment section how this is blessing you, whether you're watching live or on the replay. And also don't forget to leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more content on the Holy Spirit, prayer and spiritual warfare. Let's now look at Peter. Didn't Jesus call Peter Satan? Well, here's the context. For quite some time, the disciples believed that Jesus was coming to the earth to establish an earthly kingdom. Finally, Jesus reveals his true intentions, and we see that in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary, it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. Now, when Jesus spoke plainly about what would happen to him, Peter got riled up. First of all, Peter loved Jesus, and he didn't like what he was hearing. What do you mean you're going to be handed over? What do you mean you're going to be killed? He, he was bothered by this. So Peter speaks up. Matthew 16, verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Now, Jesus clearly explained why he called Peter Satan. Was it because he was possessed? Was it because he had a demon in him? Well, Jesus tells us why he gave him this rebuke. Matthew 16, 23. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Simple. Why did Jesus call him Satan? Because he was seeing things from a human point of view. Did he say... Get thee behind me, Satan, for you've been possessed by the devil, for you've been filled with demons. No, in fact, if you look at the original language here, you won't even see a hint of the, of the word demonized, which is the scripture's term for possession. You don't even see any hints of other demonic influence. In fact, there's no blatant language whatsoever describing possession, just like in the case of Judas. Now, in the case of Judas, the scripture told us plainly, Satan entered him. Notice here, by contrast, the scripture does not use that language. Another thing to consider here is that Peter never underwent an exorcism. Get thee behind me, Satan. Satan himself possessing you? You're going to need some major exorcism if that's the case. Yet Peter never underwent an exorcism, thus proving to us that he never had, he was never literally inhabited by Satan. And by the way, again, if you look at the original language, Jesus was merely calling Peter the adversary. In other words, what you're speaking is against the plan of God, and therefore you're an adversary. It really is that simple. There's nothing in the original language. There's nothing in the context. There's nothing indicated in what happened later on to Peter that even comes close to convincing anyone that Peter had a demon inside of him or that Satan literally, literally entered him. Um, so no, Peter is not an example of demon possession or Christians being demon possessed. And again, some might say, well, no, demonized means influence. Peter was influenced. No, no, no. Let's not get the terms mixed up. Remember, demonized means to be possessed. And I showed that slide several times. We don't have to show it again, guys. Um, but um, that's, what, was, that's what, was, what demonized means. Next, let's look at Ananias and Sapphira. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. But there was a certain man named Ananias. Now, now I'm going to point this out right up at the top. Notice here. But there was a certain man named Ananias. So this is a contrast between what's being described here in Acts chapter 5 and what was being described in Acts chapter 4. That's the language that's being used. So there's a, a distinction being drawn right up at the top of the verse here. With his wife Sapphira, sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell, as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. Now, here it's important to remember that they were not punished. Ananias and Sapphira were not punished because they withheld money. They were punished 
because they claimed to give the full amount of the money and withheld some. Now, it doesn't tell us how much they withheld. Um, some say half, could have been half. Uh, some say a quarter. Some say maybe they just, you know, a tithe. I don't know of the fact that Jesus came first for the Jew and then the Gentile. All Jesus is talking about, all the scripture is talking about here is the order of his ministry influence. First the Jew, then the Gentile. That's God's plan of salvation. These are, these are basic studies that you can do and all believers should do to understand God's plan of salvation. Came through the Jewish people, the Jew first, then the Gentile. Now, in the context, who are the children? Born again, spirit-filled believers? No. In the context, it's the unredeemed nation of Israel. This is what's so interesting to me. Of all the portions of scripture that people could use to justify the idea of Christians being demonized, I find this the least convincing. You can stretch this portion of scripture to an unstable extreme. You can twist it and apply it and twist it and apply it, and you can contort it. You can force in ideas and philosophy. You can use semantics. And this portion of scripture is probably the most unconvincing portion of scripture for the idea of Christians and demonization. Why? Because it's specifically talking about the unredeemed nation of Israel and unredeemed Gentiles. So not even talking about redeemed in general. It's specifically talking about the unredeemed, specifically nation of Israel, the, the lost sheep of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's who Jesus came for first. So some might say, but this story is specifically about exorcism. Here's what I wrote from my book, Holy Spirit, The Bondage Breaker, coming out in June of 2023. Still, one might insist, but this is a story specifically about exorcism. But we can't have it both ways. Either we are specific or we are general in our, in our interpretation and application of this portion of Scripture. If we are being general with our interpretation, then we must conclude that this is about more than just exorcism. It's about Jesus's broader ministry being available to first Jew, then Gentile. If we are being specific with our interpretation, then we must conclude that the term children is a specific reference to the nation of Israel, not New Testament believers. In either case, from both angles of interpretation, whether specific or general interpretation, it's clear that Jesus is not saying that New Testament believers can be demon-possessed, not even close. It's not meant to be shaped and twisted to our desired outcome. Guys, I, I understand this, one, this one's used a lot, but it's not even close. I would rather, I would say a better portion, if you want to believe that Christians can be demonized, a better one would be Ananias and Sapphira. That one probably a little more convincing, or even, um, you know, Peter, Jesus saying to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. But this one, as I said, I, I don't even understand where that comes from. Because in the broader interpretation of this portion of Scripture, it's talking about Jesus' ministry assignment to the unredeemed nation of Israel and then unredeemed Gentiles. That's all that's being revealed here. If you want to get ultra-specific, that's who it's talking about. Um, um, even in the term child, children. So if you want to get specific and say, well, it's talking about exorcism, well, then you got to get specific with that term children. What does it mean? So this has nothing to do with exorcism. This has nothing to do with demons inhabiting New Testament believers. New Testament believers aren't even mentioned here. Uh, John chapter 6, verse 51 says this, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer so the world may live, is my flesh. Who is the bread? Who's the bread? It's, it's Jesus. So we need to change our phrasing here. Yes, deliverance is for believers, if you're talking about deliverance from demonic attack. But remember, deliverance is more than just exorcism. So let's change what we say here. Let, let's go bigger. Let, let, let's, let's, let's push a more powerful truth. Jesus is the children's bread. If you believe that, write that in the comment section right now, whether you're watching live or replay. Jesus is the children's bread. And... That bread takes whatever the form is that we need it to take. And for the true believer, that bread would never take the form of exorcism since we cannot be possessed. Let's do one more. I mean, we can cover Paul's thorn, 
the parable of the sower, uh, the portion of scripture where the, where the Bible talks about handing the sinning individual over to Satan. I mean, there's a lot we could cover, um, but we're going to get into some more in just a more ideas. Like I'm going to talk about how we explain Christians manifesting. Then I want to talk about who exorcism is actually for. And we're going to take care of that idea about not casting demons out of unbelievers because it could come back seven times worse. We're going to look at that and we're going to expel the fear and the religious approach to that idea. And I can say that because God set me free from religious thinking. Thank you, Jesus. Ephesians 4.26, what about giving place to the devil with anger? Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Okay, so here we see that you can be angry without sinning. So it's not even a sin that's being described here. Watch this now. Ephesians 4.27, neither give place to the devil. Now, for some reason, people think that this is talking about physical spatial reality. Remember, demons attach to the physical body. If this were true, that every time you got angry that a demon could attach to you, then we're talking now not just one-time deliverance. We're talking about constantly needing to be set free from demon possession, like all the time. And then you could never know for sure any mistake you ever made, any sin you ever committed, you got to go in now and have an exorcism. Again, we're not just talking about deliverance. We're talking specifically about exorcism. That's an issue because the Bible doesn't describe that reality for believers. The New Testament believer is to walk in freedom and liberty. And if we compromise, we're susceptible to attack, but not habitation, not demonization. Uh, so again, you can't just live however you want. So the word place here isn't describing a literal physical location. In fact, you study this portion of scripture out, that word place means opportunity. Plain and simple, don't give them an opportunity to have influence, which is much different than possession. And by the way, again, this produces legalism, constant fear, constant looking over your shoulder, every little mistake, every little thought. This is why I say that the most tormented Christians I know are the ones who believe that Christians can be demonized. Why is it that only the Christians who believe that they can be demonized are under the most severe forms of spiritual attack? They might say, well, because the devil knows I'm a threat. Well, I might say it's because you exaggerate the power of the enemy in your life and you give him that power. You're deceived in giving him that power because you've put trust in his power over the trust in, your pow in the power of the Holy Spirit. If you want to know the truth, you have to line up with the word. If you want to know the truth, you have to bow to the word of God as the final authority. So the scripture here is just describing opportunity that gives the enemy influence. Again, influence being attack, nothing to do with a demon inhabiting you or attaching itself to you. So to recap some of the things we've gone over here for attempts to justify the religious idea of Christian demonization, and it is religious legalism, guys. I used to be on the other side of it, and I would say, you're religious because you're not teaching this. Now I realize, no, no, no. I was the religious one, and my goodness, this is legalism to the max. So we see Judas, no, not an example of Christian, Christians in demon possession. And if you have other examples, maybe you want me to cover, put it in the comment section. If I have some time, I'll go through the comments. And by the way, guys, as you go through the comments, you're going to see people asking these questions. What about this? What about that? What about this? Help me with the timestamps. If someone asks a question in the comment section that I answered, send them a timestamp directly in the video. Uh, Peter, is he an example of Christians and demon possession? No, not even close. Ananias and Sapphira, probably the best argument so far, but it's based on somebody we don't know for sure if they were uh, born again believers or not. And we definitely know that it was not literal demon possession that was involved. So no, that doesn't count either. Didn't Jesus tell us to pray for deliverance? That's not an example of Christians and demon possession. Uh, what about those to whom Philip preached? That's not an example of Christians and demon possession. Uh, the demon possessed people in the synagogue, the daughter of Abraham, who hath bewitched you, Galatians 3, the word sozo, deliverance being the children's bread, or the Phoenician woman, um, giving the place to the devil in anger. None of these are examples of Christians inhabiting a believer or attaching to their being to the point where it was able to control them by moving for them, talking for them, and to the point where they needed exorcism. Not an example, not one, nowhere in scripture. So I showed you so far, now this is the broader recap, because we have to do this before we go deeper. The definition of, Christ, uh, uh, the definition of demonization. One more time, let's throw that slide up. 
this is for those of you who may have skipped around or just tuned in, the definition of demonization. Let's stop complicating it. So when we say Christians cannot be possessed, but they can be demonized, you are literally saying Christians cannot be possessed, but they can be possessed. Okay? So demonization is possession. That's number one. You can say Christians can be oppressed, but if you mean habitation or possession through habitation, you're describing possession. If you say Christians can't be possessed, but they can possess demons, or they can have demons, or they can be under the power of demons, or be vexed with the demon, 